All right, this is what we call the strong finish. I am genuinely super excited about what we have in store uh, over the next coming hours. But I want to take a minute to uh, acknowledge is uh, Sam Schmidt in here. Right here is the winner of the pitch contest, Sam Schmidt. Right there, stand up. Get a round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> She is with Alpine Physical Therapy, and her pitch was a telecommuting option for patients. Very clever. She had one of her partners actually do the pitch, demonstrating the telecommunication option. So congratulations again. And again, big thanks to Missoula Federal Credit Union and the lodge at Rock Creek for uh, putting up that great prize. And for everybody else who participated in that, I want to acknowledge um, your willingness to kind of live out the values of this conference by demonstrating some courage to put yourself out there. Um, so before we do anything, I wanted to take a quick moment moment to acknowledge some of the people who have come together to really pull this event off and uh, create a vision for not just this year's event, but the vision for the future. So I need to invite Miss Morgan Slemberger out here real quick. Give it up for Morgan, you guys. Give it up for Morgan. Come on out. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Yates, and I'm one of the volunteers with the events. And I just wanted to take a moment to recognize Morgan. Um, eight weeks ago, this event was just an idea. Can you believe that? We're talking 30 sponsors, 30 volunteers, um, eight national speakers that had to get to Missoula, and not only that, but also convinced to do it without being paid. In addition, we had to get all of you here. Everybody in this room right here probably had never heard anything about an event like this in Missoula before. So I want to recognize all of you as well for taking the risk on that. Um, but once Morgan had this idea, reality sat in, right? Um, with all of these steps that had to be done. And um, I can tell you from seeing from behind the scenes, it took immense courage to actually make this happen. There were people along the way that actually said, you're crazy. This is impossible to do in eight weeks. But she pushed through it. Um, and you know, the, the coolest thing about Morgan, I think, is that um, she just continually did not want to make it about her. She wanted to make it about Missoula and make Missoula the star. So everybody that's involved, um, you know, and that came together to make this happen is just super appreciative. So just a big thank you and a round of, round of applause for making the impossible happen and having the dream. I know. All right. Big thanks. And that was Chris Yates. And you guys will have an opportunity uh, to see a little bit more of him later on today. But he's been a huge presence and sort of the master of the logistical domain. So uh, big thanks to Chris as well. All right. I'm really excited, you guys. We have an awesome performer coming up to try and amp up the energy as we move into this afternoon. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce him. This is Special FX. FX, the letters F capitalized, X capitalized. He's coming to us from uh, MASK, which is located here in Missoula. It's a professional training uh, center for people who are pursuing movement arts and creative performance. Uh, special effects is from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, <clears throat> and he's been in the world of dance for 16 years. Using his bass style of popping, he's had the privilege of sharing the stage with the likes of Missy Elliott, Telemundo 2, and The Roof. He's danced for the Miami Heat, he's danced during the Super Bowl halftime, and he's also danced at VidCon. <clears throat> Despite all of those awesome experiences, he is a proclaimed student of dance for life and continues to look for opportunities to master his craft. So give it up with me, welcome Special Effects, and you can follow him at q.specialeffects.rob on Instagram. <laughs> flew right over me and blasted a car with its laser vision. I tried to run from it, but it picked me up with its mind powers and shook me like a doll. It's true! I saw the whole thing! It is my professional opinion that now is the time to panic! <laughs> Thank you. 
kid. And I love it when a plan comes together. I've been practicing. Hmm, practicing what? Some dance moves. Close your eyes, let the rhythm get into you. 
Awesome. You guys give it up for special effects one more time. That was amazing. That was incredible. So we're going to wait just a minute here for the screen to come back down uh, as we get ready for our next artist. Uh, but digging it, man. Again, can't think say enough good things about Mask here in Missoula. So find them uh, at Facebook. And it seems like they're doing really, really amazing and uh, incredible things for the community. Uh, so we've got a bunch of great speakers coming up this afternoon. Like I said, we're going to have a really, really strong finish. And our next speaker that's going to be coming up here in just a second as we make our way down 
is Miss Ariel Adkins, who is a Twitter art and culture liaison. Uh, her, uh, <clears throat> her goal in life is to establish relationships between Twitter and a growing number of visual artists, museums, and cultural organizations. She's the founder of what is known as Artfully Aware, an art and fashion blog dedicated to being your own work of art form from head to toe. She's done a lot of other things, but this is what she's most passionate about, and you'll see it in the way she walks, the way she talks, and the way she dresses. So let's give it up for Miss Ariel. Hi, everyone. How's it going? <laughs> Good. I can barely see you, but I'm trying, to, I'm trying to make it out. Who here is feeling inspired by all of this? Personally, I'm ready to take a dance class because I cannot hold a candle to that and it was amazing. So I'm feeling very inspired and I just want to say thank you so much for having me here in Missoula. Um, I live in New York City and it's so special to come to a place like this where everyone is so involved in the community and you're so supportive of each other and um, I just feel really glad that I'm able to be a part of it. So thank you all. While I'm talking today, I want you to think about what it is that gets you up in the morning. What is your deepest, biggest passion? What is it that you would love to do, but maybe you're not doing it, or you're not doing enough of it, or you'd like to allocate more time or more resources to it? That's what I want you to think about when I'm talking about my project here today. Uh, so as she said, um, I'm Twitter's art and culture liaison, and I had the pleasure of meeting some of you yesterday during my Q&A, and we got to talk a lot about Twitter and what I'm doing there. But what I'm here today to talk about is my personal passion project, um, Artfully Aware. So what's happening here? Basically, I broke all the rules two weeks ago, and I met up in real life with someone from the internet. I know, I know, that's a terrible idea, you should never do it, that's like the number one thing that they tell you not to do. But I did, because this wonderful artist, Carrie Schmidt, who's photographed here, reached out to me via social media. She had seen my Artfully Aware project and she said, Ariel, I've been following you online, I love what you're doing, I'm an artist and I just wanted to introduce myself because I think that maybe we could do something together someday. Well, basically, this was a preordained spiritual thing, connection that happened because she lives in Seattle. And I had never been to Seattle before, but I was scheduled to go there in four days from the day that she reached out to me. So I was able to message her back, and I said, Carrie, thank you so much for reaching out. I'm actually going to be in Seattle in four days. So if there's any chance that you're going to be around and you want to meet up and maybe do something together, let's see if we can figure it out. Long story short, she picked me up downtown in Seattle. I'd never met her before, didn't know anything about her. <laughs> it was basically just a total coincidental chance. Um, she picked me up. We drove out to her art studio, which was on a mossy hill outside of Seattle, one of the most picturesque and beautiful places I could ever imagine. Um, and we made art together. She painted the large canvases that you can see behind us here in this photo, and I painted the outfit that I'm wearing. She taught me about her process, how she thinks about art, what she uses to create her paintings, her favorite paint colors, the brands, what she likes for brushes, if she uses her hands. We used all the same materials and did it all together. And it was one of the most meaningful interactions I think I've ever experienced. You know, she was about 15 years older than me. She had a bunch of kids. I'm single. I live in a city. She lives in the boonies. Like, there, we didn't really have that much in common except for our love for art and color. And that day in her studio, there was a real connection that was formed um, when we created our art together. So that's what I'm really after in my life. I do a lot of things. I teach classes. Um, I make art. You know, I go shopping, different things that are involved in my passion. But this type of experience that you see right here is really what keeps me going and what makes me get up every day and what keeps me interested in art and a part of that world. So one of the most important things to me when I'm doing this is that I'm understanding and living in the mind of the artist. One of my favorite artists is Jackson Pollock. Who here is familiar with Pollock's work? Probably a lot of you have heard of it. Um, basically, his method with painting was all about action. So he threw the paint on the canvas that was laid out on the ground, and that is how he was able to create his masterpieces that are hanging in museums all over the world. 
So when I was thinking about Pollock and I knew I wanted to do a project with Pollock, I started reading about how he actually made his work. I learned that the work was laid out on the floor, he used unprimed canvas, he used actual house paint instead of art paints that you would find in the art store. And I started collecting the things that he used to make his work. I started pretending like I was going to make a real Pollock. Like if I was going to make a painting that someone might think is a Pollock, this is how I need to do it. And I started thinking in the mind of the artist. I was reading a ton about him, reading his writings, watched a documentary about his work, and eventually created this piece of art, which is a dress inspired by Pollock that you can see here. Uh, that's me painting like Pollock, and that's Pollock painting like Pollock. <laughs> and then I wore the dress to Pollock's actual art studio, which is in, um, in the Hamptons in New York. And what happened was everyone who was in the studio that day started interacting with the work in a different way. They were asking me questions about his work. And I was like, wait, I'm like, there's curators here. You know, there's people that are meant to be your tour guide through this exhibit. You know, you should ask them. But they were asking me because I had actually made something that looked and felt and had the spirit of Pollock in it. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do through this project. So I've been working on this for about seven years now. And it originally started because I lost my mom to cancer. And you're probably wondering, OK, how, what does this have to do with cancer? Like, how does this involve your mom? Well, it's actually pretty simple. My mom was an amazing artist. She created things out of almost anything you can imagine. She made a giant sculpture out of car parts that she took from the junkyard. She was just so good at visualizing and creating things that she could do it with almost anything. One day when I was a little kid, I was sad because a bunch of kids at school had moccasins, you know, like suede moccasins, and you know, we couldn't afford to buy them. And so I was telling her, you know, these kids have these moccasins, I don't know what to do, I can't get them. And when I came home from school that day, she had made me a pair of moccasins. So she was the ultimate inspiration and influence in my life for creativity. And we always worked on projects together. Um, we created things all the time. That was just what she was into. And that was the thing that got her up in the morning. And so when she passed away, I started trying to think of a way to channel the sadness and missing her and wanting to maintain her legacy into a project of my own where I could use the skills that she taught me to make something that could potentially reach other people. So I started Artfully Aware. And that was, like I said, that was seven years ago. And I've now done over 200 different artworks and photo shoots and different things with museums and artists and galleries um, over this time period. And what's happened was that what I started as a project to help myself get through a tough time in my life, and I'll say, I mean, I still have tough days. It hasn't solved all my problems, but it gave me a way to channel that energy into something worthwhile. But what happened was, as I was doing this to try and help myself through a difficult time, I realized that it was actually reaching other people as well. So I started getting these messages from people, people all over the world who said, I saw what you're doing with Artfully Aware, and I think this is amazing, and I'm doing something like it too. And this was a moment where I realized that the thing that got me up in the morning was also something that was getting other people up in the morning, or at least helping them to get up in the morning, or maybe helping them to go to bed at night. It was actually a movement that had not yet been tapped into. And so I started getting these messages and emails and posts from people all over, all over the world. Um, this is a guy, Jason, who I've never met, and this is him wearing his Mondrian shirt at the Tate Modern in London. This is an amazing one of a mother and daughter in Virginia who sent me this, and they didn't know the story about my mom or anything like that. And so, of course, this was really meaningful when they said, look, we're doing Artfully Aware. And I told them the story how I originally started it, you know, to deal with the loss of my mom. So this was really special. And then this is another young girl um, who sent me a whole series of posts. She had done about 10 different outfits, and she said, I always wanted to be an artist, but I didn't know how. Like, I, I wasn't a good painter, I wasn't a good drawer, I didn't know how to make sculpture, but when I saw that your clothing and your personal expression can be your art, that really resonated with me. And so that was another really special time when I felt like this project is actually reaching people outside of myself. So 
over the past seven years that I've been doing this, I've basically traveled to a lot of different places and it's been really amazing. I've met a bunch of wonderful people um, and I'm continuing to think about ways to expand the project. So basically, as I started doing this art project of my own, I started consulting on the side and was helping people to figure out how to channel their creative expression. And that's a tough thing to do. I mean, raise your hand if you want to make something and sometimes you just can't or you don't know how. I feel like probably most people have had that moment. Well, that's something really common that everyone deals with. And so I started thinking about how can we help more people reach inspiration? How can this project and other amazing art projects that people are doing affect people all over the world and give them that feeling like I felt when I received photos and images from people who heard about Artfully Aware who were now doing it themselves. And so I started working and posting on social media and I started getting the opportunity to speak with different platforms. So I started going to different museums and galleries and this, this um, particular work is at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and helping the museums themselves to share their work with a wider audience. As you know, many of you I think are from Montana or live in this community, you have a lot of art going on here, but you might not have the Mona Lisa here. Or you might not have you know, some other big masterpiece that could be in Europe or in New York or San Francisco or somewhere else that's a big metropolitan area. But what I started doing was helping these organizations bring their art to people who might not necessarily be able to access it. And that was a really special thing. And once again, I started getting these messages and emails and tweets from people saying, I live in X small town. I feel so lucky that I was able to experience this artwork and what you're doing through Artfully Aware and what you're doing with the Museum of Modern Art through social media. Thank you for doing that. And that's a paraphrase of many, many messages and emails I received, but that was another moment when I felt like this is what makes these projects worthwhile. This is why it's a worthwhile pursuit to dedicate your time to the thing that, that gives you passion, because someone else that is going to find that that resonates with them as well. Um, here, this was one of, this was maybe one of like the epitomes of my life was when I got to travel to the Louvre in Paris and I wore my Mona Lisa socks, as you can see. But again, it was a moment where I was walking through the Louvre and I was wearing these outfits, you know, inspired by the artwork and people felt that that somehow made the art more accessible. And they were coming up to me and saying, oh my gosh, can I take a picture of your outfit? Or can I take a picture of your socks? Or can you explain this painting to me? And that was such a cool feeling where I felt like sometimes people see a museum or a cultural institution as a place that isn't necessarily accessible. And something like this little project that's kind of funny when you look at it, you know, someone dressing up like artwork, it's sort of silly, but it makes people engage and interact with the work in a different way. And that's what I do in my job every day now, is I help artists and art galleries and museums and organizations use Twitter and other platforms to share their work with a wider audience and make it seem like they're more accessible and more people can interact with it more easily in that way. And this is just another one of my favorite projects that I worked with um, a local artist in New York. His name is Milian Saknovic. And we love to work together. We've done many projects together, but each time I learn something new about his process and what he's passionate about and what gets him up every day. And the way that I'm able to understand and learn that is by creating alongside him and learning about what he uses to make his masterpieces and how I can do that and work that into my own everyday life. So what I just want to end with and share with you today is that whatever it is that gets you up in the morning, there's someone else out there who has that same passion, who would love to see that work or experience that design or help you solve that problem or whatever it is that you feel the world needs from you, there's someone out there who's willing to accept it. And I really just encourage you to pursue that. Whatever it takes, make the time each day to spend 15 minutes or an hour or whatever time you need to do that project 
or build that website or whatever it is that you're working on, I highly encourage you to make that happen for yourself and you will feel the rewards of it many, many fold. Thank you. Awesome. All right. So as we get ready for our next speaker to come out, I want to point out that we do have some background music out there, and that is the kickoff of River City Roots Festival. Uh, intentionally bookended this event with that one, so hopefully folks are planning to go out and check it out. Uh, lots of vendors, lots of food trucks out there, and also great lineup of music. Some of my personal favorites are playing tonight. We got uh, Fruition, Daryl Scott, and then Locals A Little Smoky. So if you haven't checked out those bands, uh, take it from me, because obviously I'm an expert on the subject, and go check them out. Uh, so one of the cool things about this event is the opportunity we've had to hear from people from all over the country who have these incredibly inspiring and unique stories and things to share. Uh, but with that, I'm also very pleased to recognize that our last two speakers are both going to be uh, Montana natives. So next up, we've got Tyler Bratt. He was born and raised in Stevensville, Montana, and was first introduced to kayaking at only six years of age by his father, Bill. By age 15, he was a kayaking prodigy, receiving national recognition for his abilities. Check this out. When we're talking about national recognitions and being a prodigy, Tyler's appeared in several films and holds the record for the highest waterfall kayak ever at 186 feet. So let's give it up for our Montana boy, Tyler. <laughs> yeah, so um, it, is, it is quite an honor to be here at the Last Best, Last Best Conference here in Missoula, standing on the stage of the Wilma. Um, this is a place that I grew up just down in the uh, Bitterroot Valley, south of town. And I got invited up here by Chris Yates, who was just on stage and actually taught me Taekwondo when I was about 12 years old, so um, it's, it's amazing to see things come full circle and it is quite an honor to be here. Um, I'm as well very much inspired by art, but I uh, certainly can't do anything like we just saw. And uh, I've, uh, I've kind of um, dedicated my life to creating art just through my lifestyle and the way that I live and the energy that I ultimately put into the world. Um, my father got me started, who was just yodeling there. I wish I could do that too. Um, but he got me started kayaking when I was about six years old and kind of tipped the first domino into a cascade of events that, that really shaped my life. And I feel really lucky um, for the opportunity to live, the, live life like I have, but kind of what I want to talk about here tonight is not how I'm, I'm different or have done um, better or more interesting things than anybody else, but how we're all really the same, and the only differences that we have is how we perceive the world around us. So I'll give you a little bit of a background on, on who I am and what I've done, and hopefully um, that will have the things that I say here carry a little bit more weight. But um, again, these are, these are just sort of, this is my perspective on the world, and it's not necessarily um, you know, the, the same or better or worse than anybody else's. So, I just hope that what I have to say here tonight will help you all um, live your life passionately, follow your dreams, and, uh, and do what you want to do. But, so I guess it all started when I was here kayaking on the Alberton Gorge, and I ran into a group of professional kayakers out there that were kind of inspired by who I was, what I was doing. I was 14 years old, 13 years old maybe. And, um, and kayaking, and at the time it was kind of an anomaly. Now, right out here at Brendan's Wave, you'll see 10-year-olds kayaking, and it's amazing. But these guys invited me on a trip to Norway and Iceland to go film for their upcoming film project. And so I went over there with Dad, and we had an incredible time, and it kind of opened the door into extreme kayaking for me, and ultimately, a professional kayaking career. After that, I attended a local um, kayaking academy called World Class Academy, but although it's local, it's based in Missoula, um, these kids travel all over the world going, um, going paddling on, on different rivers and going to, going to school at the exact same time. So I attended this kayaking school for two years, and after that, 
we, uh, we really didn't have money for a third year of this private school, and so I decided that I was going to still travel and kayak anyway. So I went to Bozeman, I laid hardwood floors for a summer, raising enough money for a six-month round-trip ticket to Africa, and then enrolled in correspondence courses, told my parents that I was going to kind of take off and, uh, and head out to Africa, uh, which, which luckily they were supportive of. And, and so I, I got, on, got on a plane over there. I was 17 years, years old at the time, a senior in high school, and I had about $300. Well, a couple of things happened. One, I lost my debit card, so I didn't have any access to that 300 bucks. And two, I ran up a significant bar tab that I uh, then had to deal with. So, so faced with this like sort of sink or swim situation, I started up a kayak school, I started raft guiding, tandem, guiding, tandem, tandem kayak guiding, anything I could, just make a little bit of money. And it really taught me this lesson that you can start from nothing in life without anything on, on, on the banks of a river and really kind of have this transpire into being able to continue to live your dream and, and follow your own pursuit. So I worked, paid my debts, got on the plane without a penny in my pocket, came back to the States, started working on the next project that I devised in, in Africa called the Oil and Water Project, where I decided it would be a good idea to um, drive a vehicle that ran on vegetable oil from Alaska to Argentina in sort of this alternative energy education, endless summer, river to river, surf wave to surf wave uh, adventure. So that's what we did. I bought a Japanese fire truck, converted it to run on vegetable oil, toured around the States uh, giving middle school presentations, and then went up to Alaska and drove it from Prudhoe Bay to Ushuaia, Argentina. I came back to the States after that, broke my first world record waterfall, Alexandra Falls, 107 feet up in the Northwest Territories, sort of used that to spearhead this next journey, which I went back to Africa, led a six-month kayaking expedition throughout southeastern Africa. Came back to the States again, where I ran Palouse Falls over here in eastern Washington. It's um, 189 feet. They might, oh yeah, there it is. Um, and, uh, and so, that was, uh, that was really a wild experience that I probably won't <laughs> recreate at any point, but it was, again, just this sort of wild journey into doing something that was hardly imagine imaginable. And what I sort of realized in this experience of running Palouse Falls is that our realities are what we make them to be. It's a, it's a representation of our perspective on the world. And when I got to Palouse Falls and saw it and looked at it, I genuinely believed that this was a runnable waterfall and that was possible to, to do in a kayak. And I spent months looking at this thing, trying to find the right water level for Palouse. And Eventually, a friend of mine, Rush in, in White Salmon, said, hey, let's go take a look at this waterfall. I knew it was going to be way too low, but I was like, okay, we'll go. We went to Palouse, and it was at this flow, 2,000 CFS on the Palouse River. And it was just the most perfect-looking waterfall I had ever seen in my life. And I decided right then and there that I wanted to do it. I told Rush, hey, let's, let's call the boys and, and do this thing tomorrow. And it turned into one of the most amazing experiences of my life. We showed up at Palouse Falls. All the boys were there. It was this beautiful, sunny, windless day, such positive energy. And we set up and just, and just made it happen in a, very, in a very natural way. Put up a few cameras and, uh, and, and went and ran it. And I really think that the thing that, that kept me safe at Palouse Falls was just genuine motivation. I didn't want to do it for any other reason than the fact that I felt it within myself to run this waterfall. Since Palouse, I um, kind of had this opportunity to, uh, to, to just do whatever I wanted. You know, I had this notoriety. I uh, had this ability to, to, pr to approach sponsors and say, hey, this is what I want to do. And I kind of knew that I could make it happen. And so I came up with the idea of my ultimate adventure, which was to kind of sustainably circumnavigate the world in a sailboat using the power of the wind, living off the ocean, bringing all of this 
equipment and gear along for a multitude of adventure sports and just circumnavigating the, circumnavigating the planet in, in pursuit of, of my ultimate dream and what I saw as the ultimate adventure. And so it took, a, it took a while before I could convince people that I needed to buy a sailboat and just literally sail it into the sunset. But it all worked out. And here I am, about the boat's in Colombia right now. It's cyclone season down in the Caribbean, so I've got it parked there just for the summer. But I'm about seven-eighths of the way around the world. We've crossed the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean to Colombia. And, and there we are. This coming winter, I'll sail it from, from Colombia back to Mexico, where we started completing the circumnavigation. But sort of this, this whole sailing experience and, and life at sea has been very, very different for me. There's just a long time of open ocean. The Atlantic took us 35 days to cross. And all that time at sea, you have a lot of time to think about things and, uh, and well, read a lot of books. And I was sort of thinking to myself, you know, how, how lucky I am to have the opportunity to do all of these things. And then I was reading this book by Bill, Bill Bryson called, um, what's it called? A Short History of Nearly Everything. And in there, they talk about how lucky we are just to be here right now. We have a uh, one in 10 to the power of 2,685,000 chance of just existing as who we are in this room today, as, as we are as humans. And so that's the, that's the same as everybody in Montana playing a game of dice with a trillion sided dice, everybody rolling their dice at the same time and all coming up with the exact same number. So just to exist, just to have the opportunity to be here, is almost unfathomable. So that kind of put things into, into perspective for me of just how incredibly lucky we all are just to have this opportunity. And then the other thing that, that sailing has really taught me is, is perspective. And I feel like you could have all the opportunity and luck or money or whatever you want in this world, but if you don't have the perspective to ultimately appreciate that, then, then, then it's meaningless. I, um, I, really, I really do believe that, um, number one, we all have the opportunity to pursue what, what we want to in this world. We have the opportunity to, to live our dreams, and it's based on how we choose to perceive them, what, what we want to do. Um, like, like was said earlier, wake up in the morning. What is it that passion that you want to do? What gets you out of bed in the morning? So we have the opportunity to do that, and I've always said that the only thing that it takes to do something is just doing it. Just start down that road, get going. If you wait for every single detail to fall into place, you'll never accomplish anything. You won't go because none of the details will ever fall into place. Another interesting perspective that, that I've come across in my life is, is about money. Who, who here is concerned about money? I know I am. But, uh, it's, but money is completely subjective. The value of $20 to me is completely different than the value of $20 to you as it is to the uh, Ugandan villager on the side of the Nile. Money is this sort of thing that was created by humans as an advanced barter system. And I chose in my life to make it my reality that money would not be an obstacle. And I've started every single thing that I've done with zero dollars, minus high school, thanks dad. Um, but I've started everything without any money and just sort of made it my goal to make money not an obstacle. Um, another thing, I'm supposed to come up with eight things to talk about, um, <laughs> is, is risk. So I've gotten a lot to where I have um, just by an understanding of fear and risk. With, with great risk comes great re reward, but at the same time, you can't be afraid of failure. Um, failure is, it has so much to do with learning, which life is ultimately about. I know that I learn everything the hard way. So my, my recommendation in any of your pursuits is don't be afraid to fail. Um, balance. Balance, balance is sought by in, in nature, and nature always finds balance. It's, it's one of these things that, that I've figured out just living my life on the oceans and the rivers, watching weather systems move over the head, overhead. But 
Ultimately, life is about balance, mind and body. Do whatever it takes to, to find your quiet time to meditate, whether it's art or music or Taekwondo or, or kayaking or whatever it is. Find that time in your life to be able to connect your mind and your body because it is one of the most powerful, important things that, that you'll do. And aside from that, I would just say, do what you love. Like I said earlier, all that it takes to do something is, is doing what you love. And, or all that it takes to do something is just doing it. So figure out what it is that you love to do. Find it in your life. Thank you guys so much for having me here this evening. Okay, so final speaker of the day coming up. He asked me to try and inflate him, and that's not an easy thing to do. I told him I would try and keep the bar just high enough so he doesn't trip over it. Uh, coming up to the stage, we've got John Root Stone, and he is the head of innovation and commercialization at Samsung. Uh, he, <laughs> woo, -hoo, somebody like Samsung. Uh, <laughs> he's a, he is a Missoula native, and he now resides full time in San Francisco with his wife and three children. He's an experienced entrepreneur. John has also worked with many global brands to drive engagement, collaboration, and results across organizations at all levels. This includes many household brands such as GE, Charles Schwab, Toyota, and others. His expertise lies in building partnerships and alliances that grow new business, managing the development of new products and services, and developing strategies to grow consumer adoption of new products and brands. Going to be a fantastic way to wrap things up. Let's go ahead and give John a warm welcome home. Hi there, uh, I'm John Stone and I, I'm with uh, Samsung and today we're going to talk about the, uh, we've got about 75 minutes to talk about the 30 steps to successful innovation. So this is a, a chart that I put together that sort of talks about the different steps that we're going to talk about today, there are 30 of them, so let's, uh, let's get down to it. I'm just joking people. I'm the only thing separating you guys from Miller time right now, right? So there's absolutely no way we're going to have a discussion like that today. Uh, thank you for having me. It is great to be here back in Missoula. Uh, I'm John Stone. Uh, I grew up over on the corner of Gerald and McLeod, just a few blocks away from here. Uh, you know, I talked to the organizers and they really I agree that I would not be making any kind of sales pitch today uh, about my current employer or what we do or, um, you know, that you should go out and buy stuff. So let's, let's be frank, okay? This is a candid conversation. I'm supposed to be up here and get vulnerable for you guys. That was the instruction from, uh, from Morgan. So I'm going to try and be as open and vulnerable as possible without taking my clothes off or showing anything to that effect up here. Uh, I'm an imposter. I'm actually not a native of Missoula. I moved here when I was two and a half. Uh, but I kind of qualify as a native because that was before really anyone had cable TV. It was before MTV, and it was definitely before the dub dub dub, right? Um, vulnerability. This is me asking my mother at at Bonner Park if I can take off my pants <laughs> so I can run through the sprinklers during the summertime. Taken by Ann Boone, who also still lives in Missoula. Uh, this is a typical picture of my family and I growing up. This is a used ex-army three-door suburban that would open in the back. And my parents weren't from here, they were from the southeast. And when we got here, we would drive all over the place and full on not do the outdoor thing. We would just open them back. We would have a picnic. And so we were kind of like, uh, like city people in the country, just kind of pretending a little bit. This matured into the 80s. And boy, the 80s took us on fierce. Look at this hair. 
right? I mean, we full on big hair in the 80s. These are my three older sisters and my folks and me. Uh, great childhood, very loving family. Um, but I didn't learn something in the 80s and I actually did some big hair myself. And this was in the 90s, which is a little bit embarrassing. Uh, so a little bit more, I wasn't top 20. I'm a proud graduate of Paxson and Hellgate High School, but I was not top 20 at Hellgate. <laughs> I was in the, uh, probably the single digits or low double digits that got out of state to school. And at the time, I graduated 91, that got me on the track to this. Uh, fulfilling my, at the time, you know, required 10, 10 careers during my lifetime. I have since worked for four startups or, and or founded some. Uh, two public companies, both with more than 150,000 people, and four strategy consulting firms, uh, some of my own creation. And one of the things that I've learned during that time is that it's really important to remember where you're from and what that offers, but also to recognize its limitations and what it doesn't. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so let's get down to it. Uh, I find that, in my experience, gigantic transformative moments in life are very seldom. Life is mostly about ebbs and flows. Uh, there are some of these, right, where you are asked to make a decision quickly, and boy, is it scary. There are some of these that are also scary, where you're going 0 to 100 in about 2.6 seconds, and you've got limited information and you aren't sure what to do, and you're gonna ask advice from friends, and you're forced to make those decisions. So today, hopefully, a few pearls from my experience will be imparted, and I hope you take at least just one thing from this presentation, because the thing is, I'm still figuring it out, and I've learned enough to say that the people that say that they figured it out either haven't or should at least be treated with sincere caution. <laughs> So, first, who recognizes this brand? Everyone, right? Who recognizes this brand? No one, right? Okay, so out of school, moving to the Bay Area, I was a freshly minted college grad. I had two offers. I had done one C programming course in college and got out to the Bay Area and I had two offers, one from Oracle, one from Liquid Audio. The Oracle one, as I'm sure you can guess, was 50% more than the Liquid Audio offer. Now, here's the interesting thing about this, if you think about these companies. Remember, this is uh, 96, 97. Uh, one of these companies is extremely well-known enterprise software company that can make boats fly. One of these companies is a startup with a little bit of money, it's above an El Salvadorian restaurant in Redwood City, California, and they're literally, this is no joke, ants crawling up the wall above the El Salvadorian restaurant in our office. Uh, so what I did is I, in, in engaging this process and thinking about what direction to take, I went through this process to ask myself, so who am I, right? And who are my people? And is the path to this company known? And do I get to create? Because I'm young, and I want to do some stuff that's different, and I'm a risk taker. So you can guess where I ended up. In an internal room inside a really small office, this is representative, this is not the actual one, in a gray cubicle with fluorescent strobing lights for about six months, the first six months, uh, I was a nobody in a nobody place, just like a bunch of other folks in Silicon Valley. But then I worked really hard. I leveraged that one C programming course into doing quality assurance for the first six months. So it's writing test scripts, testing uh, different kinds of audio codecs. And it turned out that this company, I thought it was a little cool to begin with, this company was in this new field of digital music distribution. 
Now remember, the iPod came out in, anyone? 2001. This was 1996. And in doing and committing to the work in this place, I actually, I noticed something that was a pretty big deal in one of the, co in one of the codecs. Uh, it was all about compressing regular audio down to very small file, file formats that could then be distributed online. And in the day, there were th it, uh, one, one file, which was three megabytes, took 30 minutes to download for the average consumer. <laughs> okay, <laughs> give you a little perspective there. So I noticed this aberration uh, when I was listening to this music. And it was only because I was spending 10 to 12 hours doing it. And the thing is, is that everyone was really surprised. And they couldn't believe that this guy was basically not an engineer, not an audio engineer, for, certainly, and certainly not a developer, came up with this error. Uh, so what I did was that allowed me to leverage it into an opportunity. Because what I really wanted to do was go out and talk to people. I'm really not that good at talking to machines, I mean, seriously. Uh, so I wanted to go out and talk to people. I talked to one of the founders, and he said, okay, listen, you're a nobody in a nobody <laughs> in a nowhere place. Here's an opportunity for you. And what that turned into was that 2.6 seconds, zero to 100, where essentially I, I got, it turned into an adventure, where I got to go all over the place. I had no business doing it. I was about 23, 24. Uh, and do all sorts of partnerships at the cusp, at the beginning of this huge movement that took a $40 billion industry, actually ultimately being music at the time, to a $7 billion industry, but really transferred a ton of wealth over to technology companies, right, from that industry. Aside from the politics, it was an extraordinary time to think about and experience that movement. But here's the thing. I wouldn't have been there unless I had made that choice originally not to go with the established player, which is essentially a lot of what all of you and I can try to continue to do, right? Go and do things on our own because we have an idea, because we have a business plan or otherwise. But I guess I'm here to say that, so where you work is not who you are. And this is adapting a line from Frank Bruni. But that, that brand, you, you will work for multiple things over your life. And that brand is not who you are. It doesn't have to be. You are a continuum across life. Okay, so that's the first message. The second, okay. So who's heard of these? No one, okay, I'm losing you guys. Who's heard of these guys? All right, all right. See, I didn't have to put up Apple Pay there. I did though. Uh, who's heard of American Express, Express Pay? Anyone? Oh, okay, one. That's surprising. <laughs> so after business school, uh, I went to American Express. And again, gigantic company, right? Uh, and we started looking at contactless payments. This was about uh, 14 years ago. This is before anyone else. And the biggest competitor for American Express at the time was cash, were transactions under $20. And the whole idea was how can we create a payment solution that's easy enough for consumers to use, uh, but uh, essentially uh, something that, that's convenient and easy and simple, but also that facilitates the transaction and easily implement across the hundreds of thousands of merchants that we have. So the testament to only one person actually answering that, <laughs> that question of what is Expressway is being the first doesn't mean that you're going to be the biggest or the best. If we think about innovation, about 10% sort of on average, 10% of innovation should get to market, things that you do. If you're doing more than that, you're probably not pushing yourself hard enough. If you're doing less than that, you're probably stuck in some kind of analysis paralysis. At this company, it was a fantastic chance to be an entrepreneur instead of being an entrepreneur. Gigantic company, gigantic market, um, the ability to, to really innovate on a global level. But an interesting thing happened there. Um, I was about a year and a half in, and uh, I had a five-week period that was really extraordinary. Uh, the first week after that year and a half in, I was brought into a room by my boss, and he said, 
I'm sorry, she, she said, I had kind of two bosses. She said, I don't want you to care as much about your job. The next week, there was a famous uh, blackout in New York, if anyone might remember that, along the entire eastern seaboard. And pretty much everyone in New York, maybe some of you were there, had to walk home. And I was next to Ground Zero uh, in World, at World Financial and lived on the Upper East Side. It was about seven miles in leather-soled shoes. So, hey, everyone was doing it, right? But it was just sort of one of those moments where it was like, what am I doing? The third week, my other boss was in a limo with me on the way to a customer and puked all over the place because she was so hungover from partying the night before. This is an, on the Jersey Turnpike, on the way to the customer. The fourth week, I saw that same boss sexually harass one of her male employees in front of 30 people, and everyone thought it was a scream. They thought it was the most hilarious thing they'd ever seen. And the fifth week, I walked into the office, and this is a 30-story tower, and there was someone that had expired in my bathroom, there. And so I took all of those inputs, and again, it was in quick succession. And I sort of, <laughs> it really made me think about my life, to tell you the truth, of course. Uh, and so uh, I had to ask myself, is this worth it? Um, and I decided then there, those inputs, no. And pulled stakes and headed back west, back west because I wanted to do things that mattered. Things I didn't find that the entrepreneurial thing was fantastic, really interesting experience, but I didn't really care about payments. So the second message is do things that matter to you. Third. So I came back to California and I started going through a process to find you know, what, what does matter to me. Right? What do I care about? And because, you know, not knowing is okay, but not having a process to figure that out is not okay. You really want to put something in place that's going to get you to that answer. And so that's what I spent a lot of time doing. And I tried to go as deep as possible. I investigated, I must have done maybe 75 informational interviews in real estate. Uh, I did, you know, 50 to 75 interviews in, in other categories, just trying to figure it out. But what I always came back to was this idea of the tension between emotional and rational things. I really loved creating this idea at Liquid Audio of, of this big music distribution, this completely new way of doing things. And I really love the idea at American Express that, again, that we were creating something new, but also from a rational perspective, that it was taking on this gigantic market. And I was with this big player that was, was actually going to be able to implement something huge. And that was fantastic. So this tension between the emotional and the rational, I wanted to keep on pursuing. And the thing is, is that when it came down to it, most of these these ideas and these, these really products had sort of commonality to them, which was they were really big ideas. They were true, meaning that they were solving something for people. And they were simple, right? It was a simple value proposition. It was a simple idea that people could imagine immediately latch on to. And it turns out that, that there's actually an entire industry, at the time I didn't know it, focused on that idea. The branding industry, the corporate identity industry, where if there are firms that go out and actually do this for companies. And so I joined one of the biggest and oldest of those firms called Wolf Olins, which is a London-based firm. They're the guys that uh, did Apple Records uh, for the Beatles. Uh, and I went on with them first. After that, I started my own firm with a partner and then started a new firm on my own. 
And then ultimately ended up back in the startup space on technology side and video. And across all of those things, I worked with a bunch of different brands and, and really was able to realize that dream of like the rational and emotional together and helping all of these senior executives see that and acting really crazy in front of them and sort of getting a lot of raised eyebrows uh, and certainly failing a lot, but also doing some good stuff at the same time. The startup I did after, at the end of this, after I got out of the branding industry, was called Epic. And our whole mission was to create effortless entertainment. We started in late 2011. Uh, and the whole goal was to take out, at the time, I thought it was a pretty original idea. We thought it was, excuse me, we thought it was a really original idea to take the friction out of helping people find out what they wanted to watch. There's so much content out there. How do I sort through it and get to the stuff that I actually want to watch? So we started this company. And it was a slog. And we raised some money. Uh, and I found an Israeli company that I merged with. And so all my engineers were like ex-machine learning, Israeli Defense Forces guys. Uh, and I was living the dream, if not the whole monetary side of it. Um, but the thing is, is, when it came down to it, it ended up being a product. We were too early. It was a product and not a company. And the market wasn't really ready for it. And so when we were offered a term sheet, and I've heard a couple of people today talk about term sheets that they were offered, I turned it down. Because essentially, uh, I didn't want to have to look that investor in the face after spending their money and realizing that this, this actually isn't a company. This is a product. And after having invested so much of my own capital you know, not taking a salary somewhere else and also committing money to the company. And thinking about the other people that were employed. I know Chris earlier talked about, well, you have to think about those are people you're responsible for, right? Uh, it was one of the hardest things that I've done. Uh, but it came back to this idea of how do I, from a personal perspective, how do I commit and stay committed to my principles of being big and simple and true? And so, the message out of this sort of phase is how, you know, there's, there's always another round to things. There's always another company. You're always going to see that person that you had that conversation with. Most likely you're going to see them again. That investor or that parent or that friend or that teacher or the, you know, whoever you took money from, you're going to see them again. And they're going to remember. They're going to remember not how it started, but how it ended. And so what I say here is there's always another round to every relationship you have, because it will come back around. So it's essential that the end of it be where you put. It's probably more important to end things well than however you begin it. So those are the three messages. Where you work is not who you are. Do things that matter to you. And there's always another round. Essentially, I want to end with a quote from my sister. You are the CEO of you. And I wish you all the luck in pursuing all of the passions that you all are going after. Ultimately, just remember, it's your life. Do what matters to you and make sure you do it well. All right, thanks so much. So good. I really appreciated the comment around where you work doesn't define you. And again, thinking about people in this room, I'm not sure if anybody else has ever fallen into the trap of really believing that to be true. Um, and as somebody who's recently come through that, where I was overly defined by the title that I had in the organization I worked for, uh, I can't say enough about the power of those particular words. So. So here we are, we're wrapping up our time in the Wilma and wrapping up our time together. I do again want to make one more plug for the River City Roots Festival. Uh, that is an extension of the conference, that addition of music and food and artwork. So really do get out there, enjoy it. Uh, if you see folks from the conference, say hello. 
Uh, so we're winding down. We're going to wrap it up. Uh, and so I'd like to just say a couple things <clears throat> before I pass this back to our fearless leader, Morgan, and the leadership team to kind of bring it home. So just want to say, you guys, it truly has been a privilege to be able to share space and time with you for the last couple of days. I appreciate your uh, attentiveness and commitment to the values of this conference and your willingness to put up with me and my loud ass voice. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, parting words on behalf of me. One of the quotes that I use as a company in my life is from Harold Whitman and it says don't ask yourself what the world needs ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go and do that because what the world needs is people who have come alive and that is truly a compass for me when I look around the landscape of our culture the people making the biggest impact the people that are serving each other the people that are moving our culture and society forward are people who have figured out how to come alive I know we've heard a lot of great stories about giant leaps or people like Rock who are like, I just had to take two years off. <laughs> and that's not necessarily accessible to all of that, uh, excuse me, to all of us. So as you're trying to process this information and really kind of anchoring back into this notion of how do you live your passion, I just want to make sure you remember that you have those small steps available. So if your circumstances have you in a place right now that you're not able to just do these big leaps, these big bold moves, just look at the day to day and figure out what part of this day makes me come alive and focus on that and let that continue to guide you and feed you uh, as you move forward and kind of put together the different puzzle pieces. So at this point, I'm going to invite the leadership team to come on up. You guys, come on up here and join us. For those of you that are in the back, we're going to ask that you come and join us on the main floor. We're going to do a quick closing activity. So if you wouldn't mind coming up, you're listening really well. Hey, people in the back, come up. Change up the microphone there. Remember that time. Come on up. We're going to do a closing activity. So leadership team, if you want to just come out here, you guys, this entire conference was put on by a group of volunteers who have literally been committing blood, sweat, and tears over the last several months to pull this thing off. So everybody, if you guys want to come out here, we're going to take a moment to really give these folks a round of applause and thank them for their efforts. So right here, you guys, is your leadership team. It's been a privilege. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand this one over to Morgan. Thank you. Um, I really want to take a second to thank Shannon Stober for emceeing this whole event. It's been so lovely to have her here. Um, and Paul Gladen, you should be up here too. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm um, really grateful for that. Um, so I'm just going to say um, a couple words after we do this closing activity. Um, but. So I'm going to walk you through that really quick. Um, and this was also the genius of Shannon and Chris um, working together. So underneath your seat, you have a piece of paper and a pen. And we're going to kind of wrap this whole event. Yeah, please come on down if you, if you don't have one. Um, we're going to wrap this event kind of where we started in the planning of it. Um, so you might have heard some, some themes throughout the week, um, creativity, community, and courage. Um, and those are the values of this conference and what we hope to take forward um, as we move this into another year next year. Um, so uh, the mission behind the conference is to inspire pursuits of passion that leave lasting impact. So I hope throughout this whole time you've felt some inspiration. Um, and then, again, coming back to the activity, what we want to wrap with is this idea of courage, community, and creativity. So right now, on your piece of paper, if you could consider a moment where you felt creatively inspired um, and write it down, or where you did something that was outside of your comfort zone creatively. Did you go help Adelaide fill something? Did you experience something when Ariel was talking that maybe you hadn't considered before? But I'd like you to give you just a couple seconds, and leadership team too, to think about something creative that you experienced at the conference. Need some Jeopardy time, maybe some music. Thanks. So um, now if you could really quickly use your best third grade self to fold that into a paper airplane. If you don't know, ask your neighbor for some help. Somebody, somebody knows. It doesn't have to be sophisticated, although show your creative side. Do it if you can. So the next step is to take your airplane and fly it across the room to somebody
who can get it. And if you end up without one, please go find one. But the idea here is to take a second and fly it to someone across the room. And stage included, stage, oh, on the count of three. Thank you, Chris. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Awesome. Okay, here's one. Uh-oh. And so there will be... Whoo, these are taking flight. I am really liking it. Um, please find one if you haven't. And if you see one on the ground, if you would bring it to me so I can... Some people are looking lonely up here. Thank you. Any others that people are seeing? There, I think there are some stealth fighters that have been... So now we're going to consider a moment where we were courageous um, this week or the, over the past two days. When did you sense courage from a speaker? Did you do something courageous like hula hoop and it was totally outside of your comfort zone? Did you um, go put yourself out there at one of the breakout sessions? Um, think of a moment when you were courageous and take a second to write that down. Okay, as you're wrapping your thought, it's going to recrease the plane. So whoever has rocks, I really, really feel bad for you. But um, as you wrap your thoughts, just slowly, slowly consider recreasing your plane. And if you can't crease it how it was, just go for the old school, what is it, three folds? That's my standard. Some eyes. Okay, so we're going to fly again. Oh, fly, oh, fly, oh, fly. Um, so, looks like most of you, is everybody, everybody wrapped? Have they creased? Anybody still waiting? Shout out if you're like, no, I'm not ready. Not ready, okay. Appreciate it. Can, does somebody need some creasing help? Creasing surgeon? You good? Okay, we're gonna go for it. So if everybody, and again, on the count of three, you might want to stand so you get some really good leverage. Um, and we're going to fly again. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> okay. Got some, got some jets that have gone down. And I hope while you're um, getting these, uh, you're reading the quotes that people are writing. Um, I think that's important. Okay, so on this third part, um, we're going to think about the community um, that we've developed over the last two days. So um, that could be as small as a new uh, colleague that you may have met. That could be um, a breakout session that you experienced or um, just the general main stage audience. Um, so if you're feeling a moment that you notice a feeling of community or a sense of community, write that down. Okay, on the count of three, we're going to fly for the last flight. Okay, ready? One, two, three. A child in the city. Running wild and looking pretty. That was so funny. Oh God, this last part is kind of tying back into the mission. So if you would um, write down um, kind of what you uh, think your end all takeaway is from this experience and um, if there's a passion you're looking to pursue or something that inspired you to, to pursue an endeavor or pursue something a little more courageous than you're used to, um, or you've kind of thought about a passion over the past couple days, um, if you could write that down. Okay, and as you're wrapping that, um, these airplanes are yours to take home, um, and I hope that you consider um, what everybody else has written on the paper. Hopefully no one wrote fart or something like that. Um, but that there is meaningful information, um, meaningful experiences on that sheet, and you can take it and hopefully fly with it at some point. It um, doesn't have to be tomorrow, but um, keeping that 
a little bit near and dear to your heart. Um, so I wanted to take a moment very briefly to, um, to say a couple things just about this experience and where I see the future of it going. Um, and also take a moment to thank all of the volunteers, um, including the leadership team, but we've had around 30 people who have volunteered like both at the event and then outside of the event many, many hours to make this all possible. So I just want to acknowledge all those people and if you are one of them, I welcome you to stand and get the recognition that you deserve. But I'm really, really grateful. So I want to just do some applause for them. Um, along those lines, I'll thank people in my few words. Forgive me, um, I wasn't really prepared to say anything. I, I have been saying this is a community and event, and I really strongly believe that. Um, so again, the three C's of LBCon that we just spoke about, and of those three, um, I'm really, I'm really um, inspired because Montana represents creativity, community, and courage so thoroughly. Um, and community is the one that I continually come back to living in Missoula, and it really resonates with me. I have been in awe as we've tackled this inaugural event for Missoula by the outpouring of support from volunteers, community members, and also um, some sponsors who have like just kind of bet on the, on the horse here. So it's been really, really lovely. Um, and all of these people share a vision of uniting innovative minds across the Mountain West. And I think that that's really a testament to our community. LBCon hasn't been perfect. It's had some rough edges and last minute changes, which is okay. It's scrappy and fun and grittily optimistic. However, in between those sandpaper moments, Community is the theme that stays constant and smooths out the bumps. Kaufman has ranked Montana number one again for entrepreneurship, and I truly believe that the unique ecosystem and community here affords us that title. So let's do this event again and sing our song to the world of hard work, innovation, and the fabulous people of Montana. So thank you so much for coming and really, really, really appreciate it.